I thought uh, Kay was going to say poisonous servants, and that would have changed my whole sermon, but not by much. Not by much. People complaining after having been delivered from slavery, and God sending poisonous serpents to bite his own people because they were complaining? Now that is certainly a snake story. And I have a few snake stories. Most of you, if not many of you, heard about the snake that welcomed us in our second or third night after we first moved into our house in Cologne. But that's not my best snake story. My best snake story combines an inquisitiveness, a wonder, and an imagination of a five-year-old and the king of Pumpkin Bottom. My father owned a cabin that he had built on bottomland on the banks of the Red River in eastern Kentucky. The bottomland was towered over by a rock formation on top of the mountain across the Green Red River. This exposed rock formation, complete with orangey-red striations, made it look like a giant pumpkin. Hence the name, Pumpkin Bottom. Now down below the cabin on the bank of the river was a sandbar. I would play in the sandbar for hours by myself. There was no TV in the cabin. I would play under the dappled sunlight caused by the canopy of river birches overhead. One day, after having played in the sandbar for what seemed an awfully long time, I noticed a path leading away from the sandbar, away from the cabin and up the mountainside into the woods. It was like the forest was extending to me an invitation to enter in. Paths naturally draw people to walk them, and I was no exception. I began my trek. As I was walking up the incline into the forest, my head was turned downward, watching my feet and the moss and ferns that lined the side of the path. And just when I entered into the darkness of the forest, I stopped and looked up. Looking directly into my eyes was His Majesty, the King of Pump and Bottom. I knew he was the ruler of this path because his head was higher than mine. I was dressed in nothing more than elastic banded yellow gingham shorts and was barefooted, whereas he was dressed in shiny dark black beads with stripes of yellow beads that banded him all the length of his body. His body glistened in the sunlight that was lit in from time to time by the trees swaying in the breeze. Then, as if to make sure that I knew who was boss, who was king of this forest, so that I would know who was not going to stand aside, he spread his hood by flattening his neck and hissed his you shall not pass this. He was right. I ran, and I ran screaming. I ran back down the path through the sandbar and up the hill to the cabin yelling for my dad. I ran into the cabin letting the screen door, screen door slam shut behind me and be, began telling by yelling my encounter. It was a big snake. It was a big yellow and black snake, and he ran us up and looked like a cobra. He was a stylized man, and he hissed at me. Come on, I'll show you. My father, who had seen about every animal in the woods at least once, wasn't about to stir from his nap on the sofa. He said, yellow and black and puffed up like a cobra. That was a hog-nosed snake. They're harmless. They're the ones that play dead if you poke at them with a stick or pick them up. Well, this story, this encounter of mine, wasn't any big deal to a sleepy father. I then ran across the room to where my mother was standing, washing dishes at the sink. 
Did you hear about the snake? I asked her. Yes, she said. But I'm sure it's gone now. Why did you leave the sandbar? We can't watch you if you leave the sandbar and wander the path. I imagined that night that maybe the snake hadn't been a king but a prince instead, and he was yelling, telling his mom and dad about the encounter. Mom and dad, I was leaving the forest today and got on the path heading to the river, and I encountered a fearsome beast. It was as big as me, covered in sand with a yellow band around its middle. I was so frightened that I lost control of my hood and let out a scream. When the beast turned to leave, I turned and fled back into the forest. And I imagined the snake prince's mom saying, Why did you leave the forest? We can't watch you when you leave the forest and wander the path. There. There. That was a nice, gentle snake story for those of you who may not like snakes or feel squeamish about talking about snakes. In the book of Numbers today, we had a somewhat different snake story. But it still involved wandering a path, venturing where the Israelites hadn't ventured before, and it involved lots of complaining. Now, the five-year-old in the previous story didn't complain. My eyes were filled with wonder and excitement. And the Israelites had seen much greater wonders than a hissing snake. They had seen the pillar of fire that stopped Pharaoh from gaining on them. They had seen the sea parted while they crossed to safety, and then watch it close back again on the advancing Egyptian army and crushing them. When they were without food on the wilderness pass, God provided manna for them to eat and be filled. But none of that was enough. The people were filled, and they were tired of the food God had given them. They wanted more and were impatient. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? They asked Moses. For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then it happened that God of the Old Testament, the one that is often invoked in the aftermath of a tornado, that deity that kicks butts and takes names, yes, that God sent poisonous snakes to bite and kill the Israelites. It appears that he didn't discriminate between the complainers and those that didn't complain. Then the people were out of fear, and the serpents wanted back into relationship with God, and God acquiesced. But notice that God didn't take away the serpents. The promise was that if one were bitten, then acknowledging the bronze serpent on the pole, which I take as remembering and acknowledging God's promise, Acknowledging the serpent on the pole, they would be healed. They would have life. That's all they had to do was to look upon the bronze serpent, believe the promise of God after they had been bitten, after they had wandered away from the designated area, after not wanting to advance for fear of the unknown, of making an idol of the past, and forgetting what God has done for us to get us where we are now. I know it's a very difficult path to walk, and many times we may walk with our heads down. I would bet that Trayvon Martin's family is looking back to the past now. I would venture to believe that they are wondering why God would allow their unarmed son to be shot by a neighborhood watch captain for no apparent reason other than possibly being a young black guy in a gated community, a community near Orlando where he was staying with his dad. Maybe you read about it the last few days. Trayvon Martin walked from his dad's girlfriend's home, walked to the convenience store, and was headed back to his dad's, through the, his dad's girlfriend's house, whereupon he was approached in vehicle by the neighborhood watch captain 
for being a suspicious character. Against the 911 operator's instructions, the self-proclaimed patrolman got out of his car, and minutes later, Trayvon Martin, I did, face down on the ground with Skittles and a bottle of iced tea in his pockets. Nothing else. Trayvon's parents have been bitten by a poisonous serpent, whether they were complainers or not. We will all be bitten, whether we might deserve it or not. As I see it, we have two options, going forward and gazing upon that which will save us, or to retreat back into a past of fear, retreat to an idea of every person for themselves, Retreat to a mindset now codified in many states that if I feel that you are threatening me, I can kill you with impunity. And it appears in Mr. Martin's case, at least so far, I can kill you with no questions asked. As we heard from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, all of us not in relationship with God and not in relationship with each other are dead through our trespasses and sins, our fears in which we live. Mr. Martin wasn't the only one that died that day. Our society moved another step toward an intimidating fear that attempts to eradicate relationship, embracing death and losing life, sending in more poisonous serpents but this time not by God, but by our own actions. If in the days to come we find out that Mr. Martin threatened the armed neighborhood watch guy, who, according to the press, was twice as big as the 17-year-old Martin, if in the days to come we find that Mr. Martin, while according to some witnesses, was pleading for his life, if Mr. Martin threatened a neighborhood guy with a bottle of iced tea and a pack of Skittles, or even a very defiant tongue, it is still a condemnation of being bitten by the poisonous serpent for all of us. All of us, those who think the action was justified and those who deplore it. The serpents representing destroyed relationships, the serpents representing loving self more than anything else. These serpents are in our midst, and all of us will be bitten, and some will die. Unless. Unless we gaze with wonder upon John's Jesus, who is exalted upon the cross in order to restore relationship with God and neighbor, exalted upon the cross to remove fear, exalted upon the cross to embrace love and to restore us to life. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Amen. Um.